Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Mary Hassler, Harford County Public Library CEO, and you are in for a very special treat. On June 21st, the library system will be kicking off our summer reading adventure with the theme, Oceans of Possibilities. In anticipation, we have a very special presentation focusing on the Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay, presented by the wonderful Dr. Jamie L.H. Goodall. Dr. Jamie L.H. Goodall is a staff historian at the U.S. Army Center of Military History in D.C. She has a Ph.D. in history from The Ohio State University with specializations in Atlantic world, early American, and military histories. She is also a first-generation college student. Her publications include a journal article, Tippling Houses, Rum Shops, and Taverns, How Alcohol-Fueled Informal Commercial Networks, and knowledge exchange in the West Indies. And that was in the journal of Maritime History, a National Geographic book magazine on global piracy and Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay from the colonial era to the oyster wars. Her latest book, Pirates and Privateers from the Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay, released in this past May. And she lives in Northern Virginia with her husband and two dogs. We're about to get started and as a reminder, this performance is being recorded and will be available at hcplonline.org until July 12th. Please feel free to submit your questions via the Q&A feature on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the end of the program. Now, please help me welcome Dr. Jamie L.H. Goodall. Welcome, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm going to preface this by saying you will probably hear the sounds of my people and people being the dogs. They do this every time, every time. But let us go to the presentation. All right, so I like to start talking about Pirates of the Chesapeake Bay by really digging into sort of the origins of how we get to those pirates. Because of course, when we think of pirates, we're thinking about those swashbucklers, right? Of the, the golden age. Uh, but really, people have been pirating for as long as people have been on the water. Um, the word pirate actually comes from the ancient Greek word paromai, which means attempt. And in this context, it is the attempt to steal. And as language does, it evolved. Uh, and what's really interesting is that we have records that uh, piracy existed at least in the 14th century BCE, if not earlier. Uh, one of the first recorded instances we have actually is an inscription from the Egyptian Pharatep Amenhotep III, uh, which detailed his establishment of defenses along the Nile Delta. And he was basically bragging about the fact that he was able to repel these commerce raiders. And part of the reason that piracy was able to develop so early in this region, uh, particularly the Mediterranean, is due to the geography. Um, it had fairly limited agri agricultural production unless you were further inland uh, because along the coast, it's fairly rocky. There's a lot of inlets and islets, uh, great places for pirates to hide. Uh, and so people of course are making fairly good uh, money in terms of supporting their families by participating in the maritime trades. So maritime, uh, maritime raiders, very happy with this. And basically, these pirates are able to operate with relative impunity for centuries. Uh, it's not really until the 5th century BCE when the Romans sort of come together uh, to stamp out piracy in the region that we really see that concerted effort to eradicate piracy. And of course, piracy doesn't go away. It stays forever and ever. There are still pirates today. But we move centuries forward and the precursors to our golden age uh, brethren of the coast would be the Elizabethan sea dogs. And a lot of this comes down to official cooperation. And that means between leaders of various kinds and pirates. And we know that this cooperation has existed for a very long time. And the Elizabethan sea dogs provide us that interesting way of sort of examining this. Um, so the Elizabethan sea dogs operated between about 1560 to 1605. Uh, they were commissioned specifically by Queen Elizabeth I, and 
their goal uh, or their purpose really was to augment the English naval presence uh, as the Royal Navy is developing and they are working their way into combating the growth of the Spanish Empire. Uh, and these uh, pirates who, according to English law, would have been considered privateers, uh, they earn quite a villainous reputation among the Spanish. Spanish not so very happy with them because, of course, they are the sea dog's main targets, although the Portuguese and the French do suffer at the hands of these guys. Uh, another interesting thing about them is that when we think about pirates, we think about those uh, this vision of pirates as these bachelor swashbuckling guys who don't bathe and get drunk all the time. And, you know, some of them were. But the sea dogs in particular are actually from the higher rungs of society. Uh, you've got guys like Sir Francis Drake. Uh, you've got um, his cousin, Sir John Hawkins. Uh, you know, a number of these guys who were knighted for their service. Uh, and what's different about them is that not only are they educated, but they are granted this letter of mark or this commission which under English law gave them legal authority to attack enemies. Now, in the case of the English, a letter of mark not always required up front. Uh, they are more than happy to operate on the ask for forgiveness, not permission motto. And so attempts to regulate piracy in the Elizabethan era, fairly half-hearted at best. So long as they're attacking foreign ships, particularly the Spanish, the crown tended to overlook a missing letter of mark. And basically for many English men and women, they actually saw these sea dogs as patriotic individuals, that they were promoting the Protestant religion in the face of the ever expanding Catholic Spanish and also providing some uh, means of protection as the Royal Navy developed. You know, of course the Spanish viewed them as pirates and treated them such as such in the courts. So if Queen Elizabeth I could not intervene in time, it, the, the noose was not out of the realm of possibility. Uh, but as we move forward and, and England develops into a more colonial enterprising uh, nation, we see the development of their port cities and they're fairly crucial to the regional and global economies that are developing. And piracy is a really important part of that development. Uh, and, you know, pirates wouldn't have been able to play a role for as long as they did if it was not for the uh, cooperation, whether official or implicit, between those various colonial and imperial leaders uh, in these illicit activities. Uh, and basically, uh, what we have during this time period is a shift of cooperation from the crown directly after the, the era of Queen Elizabeth I to colonial leaders like the governors who would uh, take over these islands or the North American colonies. And for those colonial officials, it's their job to balance not only the nation's desires and needs, but also the desires and wishes of the merchants and people in their colonies. And of course, they want to take care of themselves too. I mean, the colonial governor's not making that much money. So if they can get a little on the side, well, that's not going to hurt things very much, right? And so for many of these colonial governors, they actually look at complicity with piratical activities as fulfilling their duty to the crown and helping to protect the interests really of those who invested in this colonial venture. Uh, and basically what starts to develop is not really a black market. I don't like to call it a black market because it's, it's not quite that, but I call them economies of opportunity. And what it is, is that basically anywhere there's a chance to uh, operate in an economic system, the pirates kind of create their own. Um, vast majority of them not stealing treasure. So creating these economies help them to fence their loot and, and get the money that they do want. Uh, I also like to point out that by very virtue of participating in Atlantic world trade, albeit stealing, uh, the pirates were more often than not 
active participants in the trade of enslaved Africans. Um, and so we see this sort of developing informal network helping to sustain these colonies, bringing commodities, uh, money, pseudo military support, anything that sort of helps these colonies develop over time. Now, again, when we think about pirates, we think about the Caribbean, uh, no thanks to the movie, but uh, it's true, the Caribbean teeming with pirates, but when I was asked to do a local history on pirates, I was like, Psh, pirates in the Chesapeake, no way, right? Like, how would they escape? <laughs> they would be stuck. But you know what? I was wrong. The Chesapeake Bay, if you are familiar or from here, you would know that it runs approximately from Haver to Grace, Maryland in the north to Virginia Beach, Virginia in the south. And it has this really interesting, you know, you can see in the map here, uh, layout really it's not just this big open bay there's a lot of you know hiding space and wiggle room and so who's the first pirate of of the chesapeake uh well uh william claiborne is considered the first pirate you will be able to debate that for yourself uh but basically william claiborne is born to a family of middling means which we don't really have a middle class at this point but he's not super wealthy but he's definitely not poor but he's not happy with his life in england he's really bored he wants this grandiose legacy uh and so he's like all right dad it's cool that you were an alderman and hey grandpa it was cool that you were lord mayor but i want more and what's happening in England at this time period is that an abundance of population meant that uh, more often than not, sons, if they weren't the first son, they were not necessarily going to inherit any property. And so uh, land is very important in this sort of development of wealth. So when Claiborne is offered the chance to leave his home in Kent and venture to Virginia as a land surveyor in 1621, he takes it without hesitation. He's like, yes, get me on this boat. Let's do this. And he wastes absolutely no time taking advantage of what turns out to be a fairly lucrative position. Uh, his office granted him a 30 pound annual salary plus fees. And he was given an immediate land grant of 200 acres. But again, this is not enough for Claiborne. 200 acres, people have more than that and he wants more. So. He sort of ingratiates himself into the higher rungs of society and he starts to work with some councilmen and get into their good graces and he's able to secure some additional land grants over the next couple of years. Uh, basically, he reaches a point where his land holdings are about 900 or so acres. I don't even live on a single acre and I feel like my yard's too big. I don't know how you live on 900 acres, but he did. And I also wanna know how he did this because he gets his land surveyor salary doubled on a retroactive basis, which basically means, hey, I know you paid me already for the work that I did over the last few years, but you're gonna pay me again for that. And from here on forward, you're gonna pay me double. And they were like, okay, yeah. I, you know, I don't think the DOD would be too happy with that, but. He works his way from land surveyor to a counselor to the colony secretary of state. But of course, his ambitions not satisfied. In April of 1627, he is granted a commission from Sir George Yardley, who is the governor and captain general of Virginia at the time. And it basically gave Claiborne the authority to, and you know, discover, if you will, the remaining diverse places and parts of this kingdom of Virginia altogether unknown. And by unknown, they mean by English people because the land was very much known by the local indigenous people. Uh, and in the context of where Claiborne decides to set up his operations on Kent, what he names Kent Island, uh, it was inhabited by the Mattapique uh, nation and who were members of the Algonquin nation for 
nearly 12,000 years, very, very long time. But Claiborne is entrusted to basically sail through the Chesapeake, rivers, creeks, ports, havens, whatever they may be. And from there, not only claim that territory, but establish trade relations with whatever local indigenous populations he comes across, particularly in the fur trade, because the English are very jealous of how well the French are doing in the fur trade. So between about March of 1629 and May of 1631, Claiborne gets some additional commissions of a similar scope. And basically it gives him physical parameters within the degrees of 34 and 41. Now, I'm sorry, I am not a map person. Uh, my husband who does land nav all the time, very disappointed in me. I don't quite understand latitude, longitude, all that stuff, but I just know he is given a specific plot of land and he's going to stick with it. And of course, again, he decides to center these operations on Kent Island. And his idea was that he would be able to provision and trade along the coast all the way from Virginia up to Nova Scotia and back. And this sounds like such a great idea that he's even able to get funding from London merchants like William Cloberry without any promises of anything. People were just like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So what should have been a fairly simple and profitable scheme was anything but. While he is seeking that funding in London, Claiborne learns that George Calvert, Lord Baltimore, was using his influence to stake out a Catholic colony just north of Virginia. But, you know, according to Claiborne, he's like, no way this is ever going to happen. You know, the Calverts are Catholic. We are all Protestant. It's not, he's never going to, the king's never going to give him that much land to do an entire colony. So he keeps to his own plan, bringing hundreds of men to Kent Island and spent the entirety of 1631 building and planting and settling until that island was officially represented in the Virginia Assembly. So he's feeling pretty good. He's like, all right, got this land. It's now officially represented. We're good to go. But Calvert actually prevails in his own venture. And although George Calvert died in April of 1632, he had convinced King Charles I to grant the charter to the Calvert family. And so upon his death, his son, uh, Cecilius Calvert, second Lord Baltimore, takes over. That charter gives them the authority to settle 38 to 40 degrees of land unplanted. Well, apparently, if you know maps, this puts Kent Island, land and cattle, valued at over 7,000 pounds by that point, technically under the control of Maryland and the Calvert family. And Claiborne, not very happy. So he, you know, he sponsors a series of territorial debates and lots of maritime conflict ensued. Uh, and Claiborne really is kind of the driving force of this. So in 1635, a year after a number of people have come to settle the colony of Maryland, an agent of Claiborne's named Thomas Smith seized a pinnace, which is a, a light boat propelled by sails or oars. Um, they are not large boats in and of themselves, <clears throat> but it was headed to Palmer's Island, uh, it was headed past Palmer's Island on its way to Maryland. And it was filled with some valuable commodities. I mean, not as much as a true merchant vessel would be, but enough that when Smith seizes this boat and arrests its occupants, uh, they take all of it to Kent Island. And it's here where John Butler, who is Claiborne's brother-in-law, confiscates those goods as lawful prize and uh, imprisons the uh, men aboard the boat. Uh, waiting to let Calvert or uh, Claiborne decide what to do with these men and this property. Well, of course, to Calvert, this is a clear act of piracy, right? You stole my boat full of stuff on the water. That's that's piracy, like by straight legal definition. But Claiborne, he's like, yo, it's not this is my territory. And he then again sends Thomas Smith out this time 
Thomas Smith is designed to establish trade uh, with the indigenous population of Mattapani village. Uh, he again believes that this is his purview according to the commissions and charters he had been granted, but there's a problem and that is that the village lay within the boundaries of St. Mary's, Maryland. So when Smith and the men arrived to the area, Calvert's ship captains stop them and demand proof of their right to trade. And so, of course, Smith produces copies of the King's Commission that had been granted to Claiborne. And Calvert's men are like, nope, these documents are falsified. They're based on incorrect information. So they seize the men in their boat and bring them all to Maryland. Now, Calvert, he's a little more Lucy goosey with the law and he's like after a couple of days he's like you know what i'm tired of holding these guys in jail so he releases them uh, but he does keep the boat in its cargo because he's like there's a lot of cloth and beaver skins here so this is pretty pretty valuable and he's also like you have to make your own way home i don't know how they were going to do that since he kept their boat but that that was what happened so of course to Claiborne, this is the real act of piracy and he vowed that he would seek revenge for his losses. Uh, and so battles continued fairly intermittently, both physical and legal over the next few months uh, or so. And in 1637, Thomas Smith, John Butler and one of their associates, Edward Beckler were arrested and detained in Maryland on accusations of sedition, piracy and murder. And if you look at any pirate trials, more often than not, they are accused of all three of those things. Just They just go together. It's like peanut butter and jelly. A grand inquest is also held to determine what Claiborne's role is in all of this. Uh, and so in March of 1638, Claiborne is officially charged with piracy. Uh, unfortunately for Smith and Beckler, they are both hanged for piracy in June of 1638. Not quite sure what happened to Butler, uh, but given that he was Claiborne's brother-in-law, I assume he probably was spared the noose, but um, Claiborne also, you know, quite fortunately did not get hanged for piracy, but he does lose everything. He loses his goods, his lands, his cattle, his former reputation as an important Virginia official absolutely destroyed. He is not given any further opportunities to participate in the Virginia government. And so given what we know about Claiborne's desires for life, I feel like he probably would have preferred to meet the same fate as his associates. But, you know, he did not. And he fades away. But... The actions of Claiborne and his associates actually mark the first recorded convictions and executions of piracy in the Chesapeake, but of course, certainly not going to be the last. And in many ways, you can kind of look to Claiborne's path to piracy as mirroring that of the hundreds of men and women who engaged in this illicit economy. Um, some of them board merchants in the midst of a midlife crisis, like Steve Bonnet, who is my favorite. Now, he's only 28, but I guess in colonial times, that is midlife. But he ditches his wife and children. He sells his business. Um, he does leave them property and money, so they're, they're fine. But he buys a boat, wrong way to become a pirate. And he hires a pirate crew. Again, not a good way to start. Because once you pay your pirates a wage, they continue to expect you to pay that wage. So they don't operate on that pay for prey model that pirates are known for. Uh, some of them pirate hunters turned pirate like William Kidd, who did claim innocence till the day he died. But most of them are just average people. They are sailors. They are merchants. They might have been in the Royal Navy. They have families, you know, so they're, you know, they're just normal people just drinking in taverns buying businesses and land, settling down, uh, and most of their ventures are fairly short-lived. They might do one or two attacks, but not only is the life incredibly brutal and dangerous, um, you know, for most of them, this is not a career. They're using this as a means of income 
when legitimate employment was either difficult or impossible to come by. Uh, and of course, some people claimed that they were forced to join the pirates, which is a good way to get yourself out of trouble if possible. But, you know, that didn't always work out so well. Now, in the Chesapeake Bay, again, you're thinking like, why would pirates operate in the bay? But in, the, in reality, the Chesapeake colonies, despite Calvert's desire to settle Maryland as a Catholic colony, they're developed as a means to an economic end. It's all about money, money, and more money. So, you know, from the time the first English settlers arrived to Virginia in 1607-ish, throughout the colonial era, that they both become fairly important tobacco producing colonies. And of course those profits are reaped on the backs of the enslaved black laborers that were forcibly brought to the region. And so what role do pirates play in all of this? Um, and so I typically, there's so many stories, uh, they're all fun and games, but if I told you all of them, we'd be here a while and I would have read to you an entire chapter of my book, probably not that fun, but I'm going to tell you two stories. The first is about Richard Engel, and he is one of my favorites of the Chesapeake. Um, so he gets the nickname the Protestant Plunderer, and I, just, I feel like that's so right and so wrong on many different levels. But throughout the 1630s and early 1640s, Richard Engel is making a living just transporting goods and people across the Atlantic. He's primarily making his money in the tobacco trade, and so by all accounts, he is not a pirate. Uh, but his fate would change when the English Civil War erupts the following year. Now, I'm not going to get into the nitty gritty of the English Civil War, but just a breakdown. It is ultimately a conflict between the Roundheads who support Parliament and the Royalists who remain loyal to King Charles I. And basically it is just this conflict between parliament and the crown over who has more authority. Uh, and so, although King Charles I is Anglican, he is like, he is acceptable. His marriage to Catholic French princess, Henrietta Maria led many people, particularly in parliament to believe that he held private Catholic sympathies. And the fact that he is the one who granted the Calvert family their charter to settle a Catholic colony probably didn't help his case very much. But uh, the question becomes for the colonies, who do we side with? What do we do? And for the most part, when the war breaks out, the American colonies try to remain neutral. They're like, this is happening really far away. It has nothing to do with us. We're just going to do what we're doing over here and everything will be fine. But it is not. And so ultimately that neutral status turns into colonies becoming divided and the Chesapeake colonies end up remaining at least in terms of government loyal to the king so they are royalists and they are doing their part to support him and they are given orders from the king to seize any ships and goods belonging to parliament and their so-called traitorous companies and so Giles Brent who is the acting governor of Maryland immediately sets out to fulfill this order. He, this is his calling, right? He thinks this is it. Richard Engel, on the other hand, was raised a Protestant and he actually found himself in favor of parliament's rejection of what they saw as King Charles I's absolutist rule. And so the first accusations of piracy levied against Engel were done so actually in an act of revenge by a man named William Hardigy. What's really interesting about this is that Hardigy was angry at Engel because Engel had taken him to court over a debt he owed him for tobacco. So Hardigy is trying to sue Engel because Hardigy owes Engel money. And what? I don't know how that works, but he believes he has an ace up his sleeve in that he knows Ingle's Protestant background. And so he accuses Ingle of high treason against King Charles I. And as part of giving evidence of this high treason, he also gives evidence allegedly of Ingle's piratical offenses in the Chesapeake area. And so Engel is unwittingly arrested, has no idea what's going on. 
He is held without bond and his goods and his ship, the Reformation, are seized. Now, the sheriff, Edward Parker, is giving very explicit instructions when it comes to Engel. All right. These are instructions that a preschooler could follow. But rule number one, keep Engel in prison. A little difficult. There's no actual jail, but keep Engel in prison. Rule number two, under no circumstances is Engel to reboard his boat. Nope. Number three, Engel is only to be released with express permission in writing from the acting governor. Seems pretty self-explanatory. There's nothing confusing there, but you know, Engel, he makes his escape somehow. Now it's unclear, of course, how much bribery was involved, but a, a few councilmen come to Sheriff Parker and they're like, hey, we actually have license to take Engel. And so Parker is like, well, you guys are important people and you're more important than I am. You must have permission from the governor. So he lets them take Engel. Well, violation of rule number three already and number one, actually. But he's like, all right, I'm going to I'm going to follow you guys just in case like he's a little suspicious. Um, and the men all go to Ingle's boat. And what do they do? They reboard Ingle's boat. So now all the rules have been violated. And Parker realizes he's been had and he's like, oh, this is not going to be good. And so he and his men enter Ingle's boat, unfortunately for them. Ingalls men were already there in hiding and they basically beat the crap out of all of them. And so they went away running back to the governor like we let him go. And I don't know how much longer Parker was sheriff after that, but I would imagine not very long. And so, of course, the governor attempts multiple times to have Ingle arrested and convicted. And on the few times he is able to arrest Ingle. Each conviction attempt is a failure because each jury comes back with a finding of insufficient evidence to prosecute. And so the governor is not deterred, though. He, he's going to get his man. And so he issues another warrant for Ingalls arrest, this time on the grounds that he assaulted a man named Bishop. And this time, when threatened with arrest, Ingle reportedly told the governor he would destroy the homes of important local residents, including the governor. So he was officially charged with piracy, mutiny, trespass, contempt, and misdemeanors. So just throw the book at him. So if Ingle wasn't technically a pirate before, he's about to become one. So Ingle tells a different story. He says he's actually a privateer because Parliament had given him a letter of mark. And as a parliamentary supporter, it's legal. Well, that's there's a lot of back and forth. And, you know, according to Ingle, he is saving the people of the colony from the tyrannical papists. And it is his duty to lay down his life and fortune in that goal. I mean, a lot of hyperbole, not sure how much of that was just an attempt to get away from the piracy accusations, but, you know, regardless of whose version you believe, Catholic Maryland falls into nearly two years of hardship in a period known as the plundering time. And basically what happens is there's no real settled government during this time period to put a stop to the piratical incursions. The acting governor, Giles Brent, worthless at his job. And Ingle decides, you know what? You tried to arrest me again. I'm going to make good on my promise. And so he goes with his men, goes to the home of acting governor Giles Brent and basically steals anything and everything that is not nailed down. You, whatever it is, furniture, account books, silverware, linens, servants, enslaved people. He just takes everything and then allegedly burns the house to the ground. Uh, he's not done because he realizes that the governor has placed a lot of his goods in his sister's house just in case Ingle made good on his promise. So they go to his sister's house 
and steal everything and allegedly burn it to the ground. But Ingalls depredations cannot last forever. Uh, with the help of Virginia and its governor, Berkeley, the colonial governor of Maryland was able to assemble enough men and guns in late 1646 to sort of reclaim the colony. And it basically kind of puts an end to Ingalls' success. And we don't really have much information about what happened to Ingle afterwards. Uh, I, you know, I should probably dig a little deeper, but I like to envision him just being like, all right, the bay is too small for me. And he just goes to the Caribbean and lives out his life in, you know, the Bahamas. I, you know, I just feel like that would be a good place for him. My second story, also very odd, but fun. So here are four guys. Edward Davis, Peter Cloyes, Lionel Delawafer, and John Hinson. And they, it, it's just a hot summer day in June of 1688. And they are making their way through the Chesapeake in a fairly unassuming shallop, which is, again, another light sailboat, which was used mainly for coastal fishing. So again, you can imagine it's, it's not a very big boat. Uh, so the men aboard were these men and they're not alone. They are accompanied by a treasure trove of goods, as much as you could fit in a boat that size. Uh, they had bags of Spanish pieces of eight, broken silver, uh, expensive linens, silks, fine cloths. The goods are valued at almost 3000 pounds. Um, and so how do these four random guys have such a wealth of belongings? Well, it turns out that they were former associates of the South Sea Buccaneer, John Cook, and their exploits are actually chronicled in William Dampier's A New Voyage Round the World. Now, so throughout the early 1680s, Cook and his men are terrorizing Spanish outposts, um, and the men plunder their way through the South Seas, even after Cook's untimely death. Uh, coming back to the Chesapeake frequently to refit their ship and replenish their supplies. And as their numbers continue to grow, these four men decide that it's been great, good times have been had, but they're ready to retire from their life of seaborne crime and they want to live the rest of their lives in peace and comfort back in the Chesapeake. Unfortunately for them, King James had recently renewed his predecessors proclamation against piracy in an attempt to eradicate the issue of piracy in the West Indies and the broader Atlantic. So as part of this, the Crown commissions a man named Sir Robert Holmes, and that commission places his authority above that of the English colonial governors in all of the Atlantic world colonies. So all those governors who are able to cooperate with pirates no longer can save them if Holmes is the one who captures them. It also gives Holmes the ability to retain any profits that he or his agent sees from pirates or even suspected pirates. So you can imagine it was kind of in his best interest to just take every ship he saw. And of course, he was immediately suspicious when he witnessed the rather large chests on board this unassuming shallop and he ordered the men to stop. And so Holmes seizes the men and their goods under suspicion of piracy and immediately ships them to Jamestown. Now the men were independently interrogated by members of the council in Virginia and starting out both Wafer and Hinson, they're like, we kind of know each other, but they denied having known Davis for very long Say, uh, saying that they had encountered each other in Bermuda recently. Wafer and Hinson also denied being privateers or ever having been present in the South Seas. Um, they're like, prove it. How are you going to prove that I was there? You can't. And Wafer also claims he spent the last several years in the West Indies and that, yeah, you know, sometimes he did trade with the Spanish, which was illegal. And that, yeah, sometimes he did trade with pirates and that was illegal. That all the goods that he had with him were actually bequeathed to him from a friend in Lynn Haven. Unfortunately for the men and all of their denials, 
It would be the testimony of Peter Cloyce, who was the only black man aboard the boat that would spell trouble for them. According to Cloyce's testimony, all of the men had been plundering for many years. Of course, one has to wonder how much of Cloyce's testimony was coerced, and I would say probably all of it. Uh, regardless, when confronted with Cloyce's testimony, the other men begin to alter their stories. And if you have ever watched a cop procedural drama or listened to a true crime podcast, you will know that the moment you change your story, that's it, you're guilty. You did it. And so they begin to claim that they had actually passed between Pennsylvania and Maryland and that in doing so, they received certificates of immunity from a Captain Thomas Allen of HMS Quaker and ar argued that Holmes and his men had ignored those certificates of immunity, but it was no use. The men were held in jail at Jamestown for a while. Now, fortunately for them, a lawyer named Micaiah Perry, reading the newspaper, heard of their plight and believed he could get the men out of jail based on the proclamation's caveat, which was... If a pirate or privateer surrenders within 18 months of the issuance of the proclamation, they would receive full and gracious pardons. There's only one problem, and that is to receive the pardon, you have to admit guilt. And if you admit guilt, that means official forfeiture of all the goods and silver that they'd acquired. Now, you know, Perry convinces them, and he's like, look, if you admit to the crime, you lose your goods, but you get to live. If you maintain your innocence, you still lose your goods and you die. Which would you prefer? And so the men are like, all right, fine. We will admit guilt, kind of. But they do petition for the restoration of their confiscated goods with a promise that they will give 300 pounds to the college at Virginia. And everybody's like, um, okay, that's going to happen. Unfortunately for the men, they were able to get the pardons, but by the time all of the legal shenanigans had been, you know, handled, all of their goods and silver had been rifled through by every official you can imagine. So they got back a fraction of what they started with. Basically, it was kind of like, here's a, enough to get you home. Um, but ironically enough, the men are good on their word and they actually deliver that 300 pounds to the college, which is now the College of William and Mary. So College of William and Mary founded by pirates, you know, totally missed opportunity for their mascot, I argue. But with that, I will leave you all to do questions. Jamie, thank you so much. That was amazing and lots of good information. So we do have some really great questions. First of all, Joel would like to know, did Sir Francis Drake make up the word arg? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so a lot of the pirate speak that we are familiar with either came from uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, or it was part of the persona that Robert Newton put on in the 1950s, first when he portrayed Long John Silver in the 1950 adaptation of Treasure Island, or the 1951 or 52 uh, film Blackbeard that he did. Um, in both cases, he exaggerated his West Country accent uh, from England, and that's sort of where we get that what pirates sound like, but also a lot of the words he would use, uh, he just kind of like, it was off the cuff. So uh, they would have talked just like any other sailor. Now there were some phrases that were common to sailors, not just pirates, like shiver me timbers, but for the most part, things like arg and a vast ye matey, uh, probably not. Probably not. I guess, I guess maybe we should put a uh, disclosure on talk like a pirate day in the fall when we, <laughs> when we do celebrate all things pirate. Uh, <laughs> so we have another question. What started your lifelong love and interest in pirates? What, what kind of got you started down this very roguish path? <laughs> well, funny story. It was not a lifelong passion or pursuit. <laughs> 
Um, actually, when I was growing up, I did love history. Uh, I, I devoured my mom's time life books, but they were on ancient Egypt and Rome and the Roman Republic. So I was, I was early on thinking I'll be an Egyptologist. That's not, you can't do that anymore. But I decided I want to make a lot of money. So I'm going to be a medical doctor. Well, that did not work out because by the time I got to college, having taken things like biomed tech and medical terminology, I was bored out of my mind. And so I got to college, I took an archeology span class, fell in love and did my bachelor's degree in archeology. span And I was like, I'm gonna be an archeologist. span Well, herniated three discs in my back the first week of our summer dig. Mm-hmm. And I was like, well, this is, mm, nope. That nope. literally backbreaking work. So I was in school and about to graduate and I talked to my mentor, Dr. Sheila Phipps, and she was like, well, what else have you enjoyed? And I had taken a museum course and I told her about it. And she was like, well, stay in and get a master's degree here uh, in museum studies. She was like, you get to do all the cool archeology span and history stuff, but in a nicer setting. <laughs> So I did my master's, uh, did an eight week internship as the sole archivist at the Brownsville Historical Society in Texas. I finished this list of things that the curator had given me to do on my first day. I went to go leave at the end of my day, told her I finished the list and she was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I finished the list. I'm going to go home. She was like, well, that was the list for your entire internship. She'd never had an intern before, clearly. So I spent the next eight weeks bored out of my mind and talked to Dr. Phipps again. I was like, I don't know what to do. And so we talked and decided that the PhD in history would be the route for me. And it just so happened I did a comparison contrast paper for my European imperialism class on Sir Francis Drake and Sir Henry Morgan. And I used that as my writing sample for colleges. And when I got accepted to the Ohio state, the woman who had become my advisor was like, do you want to write about pirates as your dissertation? And I was like that I can do that. And she was like, yeah, why not? And I was like, well, sign me up and been pirates ever since. What an amazing advisor. I'd love it. That would be perfect. And we're so glad that you didn't come go into the medical field like that. And that you're with us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so another question for you, if you were a pirate, Queen, and you had your own pirate ship what would you name it Ooh, that's a good one I feel like I would want to name it something absolutely ridiculous I think I would call it the bullshit rebellion oh <gasps> children you did not hear that Just sorry to- <laughs> I'm very teasing. <laughs> All right, that's a cool name. I like that. That would work. And I could see you. I could see you're in your outfit <laughs> standing on the, the front of the ship, which I can't, the bow. Isn't that the bow on the front? <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Okay, so here's another good question. Out of all our founding fathers and in, in historical founding fathers, who do you think would have made an awesome pirate? Hmm. This is so much better than the question I would ask my students about which president would win in a knife fight. Oh, <laughs> yeah. that's a good question. <laughs> Let me think about that. that a founding father that would have made a good pirate. Um, you know, I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to take the, the late, the, you know, the, the loser's way out and I'm going to say George Washington. <laughs> He has some, he has some experience fighting. Um, he knows how to lead a group of people generally. And, you know, I just, I feel like he would have a mission and he would stick to it and he would figure it out when things went wrong, which as a pirate, things go wrong all the time. So. And I, he would make a great, uh, captain on the pirate ship. I can just see him now with his little (laughs) long hair and the candles on fire. Yeah. He would be awesome. Plus he's got the commanding height. Yeah. Remember, everybody was really short back then, except yeah. for. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, your, your new book came out in May and it is called, let me repeat everybody, because you need to get copies of it. Pirates and Privateers from Long Island Sound to Delaware Bay. 
So congratulations on that. Thank you. Do you have another favorite book about pirates that you would recommend? It could be one of yours that you've written or it could be somebody else's. Um, okay, well, aside from mine, obviously, um, I would have to say uh, there are two very recent books that I, I will recommend because there's so many great books that have been published like over the last 10 or so years. The first I would say would be Rebecca Simon's uh, Why We Are why we love pirates the hunt for captain kid um and also her new book is about to come out on Anne, bonnie and mary reed so Ooh. check that out and then the second would be a book by my colleague jeremy r moss uh the life and trials of the gentleman pirate steed bonnet uh because not only is steed bonnet my favorite pirate but jeremy did a great job with that research uh and his new book about the uh, fight between the French pirate of the Bay and uh, Governor Nicholson of Virginia is about to come out at the end of this month. So lots of fun pirate stuff coming out. That's, oh, that is lots of fun. And Steve Bonnet, he's one of my favorite ones too. Yeah, he's a good one. All right. One more question we have. Do you have a favorite history podcast or can you recommend a history podcast, or maybe two, um, that you would recommend for folks to catch up on? Uh, well, the first that I will recommend is called Her Story on the Rocks. Um, it is these two fabulous women from Baltimore who uh, basically get together. They create themed cocktails for the two women that they talk about. And they each tell the life stories of these, of these two women. Uh, and then at the end of the episode, they do kind of a comparison contrast between their lives and what they learned about them. Uh, and so just, and they do these awesome deep dives into these women's lives. So I would say her story on the rocks, especially because support local. Um, if I had to do a second one, mm, I'm not going to lie. I mostly listen to true crime podcasts. <laughs> Oh, but that's good. <laughs> we have a lot of fans in Hartford County who like true crime podcasts. So. All right, great. So Joel would like to know, if this is a good question, how can he become a pirate? Uh, well, don't buy a boat, steal one. Uh, don't hire a crew, offer them adventure and intrigue and have them optionally join you. Um, make sure that you have a good hiding place, like a place that you can go back to or nobody's gonna find you, or at least the community loves you so much that they will protect you. Um, and drink after the battle, not before. Excellent advice, excellent advice. You do not drink before the battle. Uh, you might not get to the war. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Jamie, thank you so very much. This was so much fun. And what a great way to kick off our summer reading challenge because it's, we love pirates. As I said, in Harford County, we're always celebrating pirates. It must be the rogue in us. I don't know. But thank you, everyone. Again, please check out Jamie's books. Um, they're wonderful. Um, make sure you check at the library. We probably have them in the library so you can borrow them if you wish. And everybody, just keep that little pirate heart within you. Um, it's all there. And thank you so much. You're getting a lot of accolades, uh, Jamie. Thank you. Thank you from Andrew and Leslie and, and Joel. Thank you so very much. Special and remember- shout out to Jessica. Oh. She is my former student. Oh, that's so sweet. Well, hi, Jessica. Thank you for joining us tonight. <laughs> and remember everyone, this will be um, available until July 12th. So you can watch it as many times as you wish. And uh, again, thank you everyone. We'll see you at our next program event. And again, See you at the library. Good night.